Happy Sunday, everybody. God bless you. Uh, my name is Ayo Akerele. It's another day to have a very robust and sincere discussion on uh, our value systems change agenda. Um, we can't continue. Thank you very much. Aicha Adofu. Sorry, I didn't know your name. Sorry. Uh, sorry if I've, I've pronounced it in the wrong way. We can't continue to do things the same way. And uh, um, we just have to make a change and do things differently as Africans. Uh, for many of us living in a developed world, you and I, we agree with me that if we continue to do things the way we did it from many of the countries of Africa, where we have come from, we will find ourselves in big, big, big problem. And so I've gotten a very big burden for Africa, uh, and particularly for Western Africa, Nigeria in particular, and uh, other African countries. And so I've had this vision and this idea to come up and do a value systems change project. Maybe a book will come out of this. I've been thinking about it. Uh, we've had 23 sessions now, very profound and very powerful seminars. So I'm probably looking for someone who can transcribe audio to uh, texts, Ma Microsoft Word uh, texts. It's a lot of work. So if you know someone who can do that, you're going to pick all the 31 videos and uh, listen to them and transcribe them. And you're going to be paid for it. Because I'm thinking a book should come out of this that we can sell all across Africa and Nigeria in particular. We've dealt with so many, many things. Bribery and corruption, ritual killings, gratitude and thanksgiving, um, price fixing, all the social problems confronting Africa. 23 sessions have been held. Now, each of these sessions, if people were to go for seminars, Good afternoon, Sister Stella. God bless you. <laughs> if we were to go for a seminar, uh, many people would have paid a lot of money for this. It's a lot of work to do this research. And, and basically, what you are getting from these sessions are things you will get from any other seminars you attend, sincerely speaking. Because the quality of work that I put into these things in terms of research, professional experience, life experience, all kinds of documents and uh, um, articles that I refer to to come up with a one-hour seminar, which I'm not, I'm not being paid for. <laughs> it's a lot of work. and uh, But I'm happy to do it. It's my own sacrifice to helping my brothers and sisters in Africa to become better people. And uh, I'm not a money-minded person. I'm not a materialistic person. It is not about money. Life is not about money. Life is about impact. Life is about... Thank you, thank you my sister. <laughs> it's not been easy. You can see that my voice is a bit coarse. I had a very powerful service in church this morning. and uh, But because of this project, we must finish it. We've got seven more sessions. Seven more sessions. It must be finished. That is why I'm thinking of making the book. And uh, to make it... Uh, like an institution to perpetuate it because many people will forget about the seminars and the sessions on the Facebook but when there is a book um, we can circulate around get across to people in Africa at the grassroots level it's going to change a lot of people's lives thank you so much my brother it's going to change a lot of people's life and uh, that is my own little quota little contribution to the emancipation and development of Africa. So I am not doing these sessions basically to preach uh, to people o occasionally because I am influenced by biblical principles. Occasionally I'll be putting in one or two perspectives that are Christian oriented. Uh, maybe before the end of the year, in the last two, three days, I will do some very serious uh, teaching, biblical teaching uh, for my Christian brothers. But today, there is a very serious problem going on in Nigeria now. The issue of fuel scarcity. 
in the past one week, I have been using Nigeria as a case study because Nigeria is the biggest, the largest economy probably in Africa now. And uh, Nigeria has one of the greatest opportunities to influence and impact the continent at large. And so I'm feeling that if we can get things right and get some people to change, even if everybody is not going to change, if only few people will change, one changed person can affect a whole generation. You don't know the impact of one arm robber that changes. <laughs> one arm robber. The impact of one terrorist that repents and changes and becomes good. The lives of thousands of people are, are going to be protected because of that one man. So we don't quantify the impact of change using mathematical formula. Oh, because it is only 10 people that have changed. It means we have had oh, only limited change. If 10 people change in a nation and become good people, you don't know the number of millions of people they can impact. 10 people. That is how powerful human beings are. One human being can change a whole nation. One man can change a whole nation. One. One. So immediately you begin to think one. You'll be able to put yourself in that position. That if I am the one and I change, I can influence the whole world. One, man. The power of one. 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 The power of one. One is very powerful. <laughs> one is very powerful. Now the little changes that God has brought into my own life, I'm still changing. I'm not perfect. But the little changes God has brought into my own life has affected thousands of people. Thousands of people, directly and indirectly, in different parts of the world. Now, the little changes God has brought into your whole life too, as my friends, you are watching me today, you don't know how many people you have impacted, you have influenced. There is one of my brothers, listen to me now, I won't mention his name, who actually helped a missionary, sent some money to a missionary somewhere in Africa. Now, you don't know, it's only one person that did it. Now, that missionary is now ministering to hundreds of people. In the last two two weeks now he has traveled talking to hundreds of people and he has used the money sent to him by that brother to travel to that place to talk to hundreds of people now he's sending me reports that hundreds of people are changing they are repenting they are converting now you will know the impact of one man that has helped a missionary on the lives of hundreds of people it, this thing is very serious it's a strategic thing and the impact of hundreds of people that have stopped committing crime on millions of people. Because each of that, each of those people may become governor tomorrow or become MD of a company, employee of labor. It will influence other people. And so it's a geometric result. You don't, you can't quantify it. You can't quantify it. So the little that you are doing that I am doing is going very far to help people. So the people I meet, Everybody I meet online, I meet on Facebook, I meet Facebook, I try to apply kingdom values. I try to do my best to put in, put to, to shape them, to tell them the right thing, to show respect. Everything I've been saying, myself, I'm trying to change. I'm trying to adapt. So that if I can influence 10, 20, 50, 100 people in my lifetime, or 1,000, God give me grace. And these are the few people I can influence. And you can influence 100, 200, 1,000. And we do it in our respective spheres of influence. The impact will be enormous. The impact will be enormous. So we have a very serious subject this afternoon. And I call it Systems, Structures, and Institutions. Africa's Pathway for the Emergence of Effective Leaders. Systems, Structures, and Institutions. Africa's Pathway to the emergence of effective leaders. As of today, one of Africa's biggest, not even one, the biggest African country, Nigeria, is bedeviled by a grippling fuel problem. This is a Christmas that people are supposed to be spending with a family in an environment that is relaxed and serene, but people are battling with fuel. People are battling with trouble. People are going through stress. People are sweating out. People are on queues for hours. A lot of programs are being cancelled. Prices of goods have increased. Transportation prices and fares have increased. People are unable to give themselves good Christmas. And people are beginning to put curses on leaders. Oh, this leader is the problem. And they are cursing people. All kinds of things are going on Facebook and social media. My fellow Nigerians are very mad with their leaders. Are very mad with uh, their president, are very mad with their governors. And I don't think that this madness and this anger is is uh, is not called for. It is called for. It is called for. 
uh, we have we are all Nigerians. For those that are Nigerian, listen to me. And uh, we have family member there. Even though I don't live in Nigeria now, I've got family members. When things are not fine with them, I feel the effect here. I can't count how many people, how many times I have to send money to people to help people. And so when my family is going through problem, I am not happy wherever I am. When they are not comfortable, I am not comfortable because they put pressure on my finances. And so when my dad is not doing well and is going through crisis, it calls on me. When my sisters are not doing fine, it calls on me. But if they are doing fine, things are fine, it impacts me as well. So I am a stakeholder in Africa's problem. Whatever is happening there is affecting me. I've got family and friends in many parts of Africa, in Cameroon, in South Africa, in Ghana. I've got extended family, pastor friends. And when things are happening in their countries, we talk on the phone. If I can be of help, I may help them. If I can't help them, I pray with them. So it is not like, oh, this man is staying in a country, he doesn't know what is happening, he's just speaking English and whatever. No, no, I have very strong influence. I'm sorry, very strong stakes in Africa particularly in the western part of Africa. And so it is my responsibility to do my own, to play my own role, to synthesize our people that the anger and the madness that we are directing at leaders today, it is belated. It is belated. Many of us went out there to vote for people and we put quacks and criminals in power. We put people who paid us to exchange our vote for their money. And so it is garbage in, garbage out. Just like a computer system. You put, whatever you put in the computer, is going to give it back to you. So 2018 is on the way. Like I said a few days ago, we have the opportunity now to select new leaders. And time and again, some of my brothers and sisters are still going to make a mistake of electing wrong set of people who we promise them temporary gratification at the expense of long-term benefits. They will promise them comfort now. I will give you money. Vote for me. I will buy this for you. We we'll give you this. We we'll buy food for you. And many people will exchange their future for their, for their presence. There is nothing wrong in making sure that your present is good, but no wise person wants to sell his future at the expense of his presence. In fact, it's better to suffer immediately now and enjoy for the rest of your life than enjoy now briefly and suffer for the rest of your life. It is always worse to, enjoy, to experience the latter. So systems, structures, and institutions, these things provide a pathway for the emergence of effective leaders. Everything happening in Africa today, happening in Nigeria today, is at the foot of leadership. The number one problem of Africans is leadership. There is corruption in every nation of the world. There is corruption in the US, in Australia, in Germany, all over the EU, in Canada, in Japan, in China. There is corruption everywhere. Every human being has an inherent ability <laughs> to be corrupt. Every human being has an inherent ability for corruption. There is crime everywhere. We believe what I'm saying. Go online, go on CNN, BBC. You see all kind of unimaginable things happening in America. People killing, people carrying guns, go to a shopping mall, shoot everybody. Young people carrying guns, go to university, kill people. All some of these things don't even happen in Africa. So I understand that crime is in every nation. But what makes these nations different from Africa? In Africa, individually we are brilliant. Collectively we are weak. That is a conclusion that has been drawn years ago. We are very strong individually. You find very brilliant Africans, brilliant professors, brilliant doctors, brilliant pharmacists, brilliant intelligent farmers, intelligent lecturers, individually. But when you put us together, problem starts. When you put us together, problem starts. Now, there is a concept in HR which has been used in politics as well. It's called diversity. Diversity is when people come together with different traits, different languages, different values different different social status and you bring them together they are diverse diverse group and so there is this concept where people tell you there is strength in diversity which is very good everybody brings his own strength his own skills and bring them together on board on the table and then we apply it to solve common problem but diversity has advantages and has disadvantages diversity has advantages and has disadvantages it is not in every context that people must be different 
There are certain contests where you need the same people that think the same way to do the same thing. This is where we are having problem in Africa. There is no distinction between the negative side of adversity and the positive side of adversity. So everything is lumped together. And that is where Nigeria's problem started from. It was the British that brought in the amalgamation of Nigeria in 1914 and put the North, South, East and West and put them together and put underneath this thing, oh, diversity is good. So when let's have diverse people speaking different languages. The problem that that thing has caused Nigeria, the problem it has caused some other African countries that were amalgamated together and put people with dissimilar values, people with dissimilar culture, people with dissimilar mindset and orientation, put them together and use a, 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 a lopsided philosophical stance to force them to do the same thing. This is what has brought our nations to where it is today. Pick any Western country, even Britain, the same country that brought in amalgamation to Africa. Britain brought Britain, Britain is the, was the most powerful empire. Many, many, many years ago, they colonized a vast portion of Africa. Britain colonized Ghana, colonized Nigeria, colonized Kenya, and some other African countries. In fact, they colonized some and some francophone countries. Britain colonized some part of Cameroon, some part of Angola. Then the French colonized the other part. So the British were very strong. But today, the same Britain that enforced the culture of diversity on Africa and made sure that we they, they, they forcefully merge people with different line of thinking. They match us together. And they sold this dumb it was. Diversity is always good. Diversity is always good. There is no diversity in their own country. In terms of the of the of the of the metrics that we use to measure it in Africa, everybody living in the United Kingdom speak only one language, English language. Everybody living in the UK speak only one language. You cannot find two languages there. Even in Scotland, where they have some Scottish English, it is still English language. In Wales, it's still English language. Northern Ireland, it's still English language. But now Nigeria has more than 740 local governments with everybody almost speaking different languages. And they crammed them together and sold the idea to our leaders and they said diversity is good. But they did not do the same thing for their own country. Why didn't Britain break Britain to 500 languages? Spanish, Japanese, Korean, Arabic and mix them together. They didn't do that for their country. Now, can you see where the gaps are in that mindset? This is what is producing the problems. We are, can you see, 520 languages. 520 languages. How do you put 520 languages of different people together in the same place and you want that country to work? How will it work? How will it work? How will people be speaking different languages and they must live together in the same place? I don't understand. The people that sold this dummy to us, they speak only one language. In the U.S., they speak only one language. Of course, there are Mexicans, there are Spanish in the U.S. U.S. has different people in the world. But the only legal tender in that country is English language. English language. Everybody speaks English language. And these are the people that sold the diversity concept to us. That is why Africa is not working and Nigeria is not working because the people that should sit together and make policy and decision and develop sound institutions and systems, they all speak different languages. They think differently. They have different values. They have different ideas. So they can never agree. <laughs> they can, it's like putting water and oil in the same cup. It can never mix. There are positive sides of it. Oh, our culture is very rich. We learn from Aousas. We learn from Igbos. We learn from Yorubas. Everybody bring their culture on the table. It is as good as that. Beyond that, it has no other advantages other than what we are finding ourselves in today. This is one of the foundations of the problem confronting Africa. And Nigeria has been held on the throat for more than 100 years, since 1914. 103 years of amalgamation. And nobody seems to have 
any solution to that problem. Nobody seems to have any solution. And I don't think there's a solution in scope until some forms of organization and reorganization. Yes, you're right, my sister. You're right. You're right. In there are some the English and Spanish are sp spoken locally. Yeah, even in England, there are there are there are Arabic people in England that speak their own Arabic. What I'm referring to is that the number one official language that is permitted in the US is English language. They could speak Spanish and speak it among themselves, but everybody knows that it is the say, the constitution of every state in the US is written in English language. There is nothing like us bringing our own value system from our own culture. Everybody submits to Washington. Even though each state is independent, they do some things differently. North American countries sometimes have independent policies and each state has its own law. But at the center, everything still boils down to one language. So what that thing does is that it affects their thinking. Now, you're not thinking Ausa. You're not thinking Igbo. There is a way Yoruba man thinks. It's different. <laughs> There is a way you know, man thinks is different from the way I some people think. It's a different thing like, altogether. Even though we have the same the same degree, we went to the same university, we think differently. Our values are different. Our values are different. Pick somebody from Dallas, compare him with somebody from Boston. Their thinking is it's correlated, not exactly similar, but a bit correlated. A bit correlated. So the correlation is very weak in the African setting. That is why individually you find a very brilliant Aousa professor in Nigeria, a very brilliant Igbo professor, a very intelligent Yoruba professor. They individually they will be writing papers, working for World Bank, but put them together in the same room. There is trouble. Put them together to create policies and create laws. There is trouble. There are all the 520 tribes that are under each of those languages begin to speak and influence. The Aousa will influence the Aousa. Don't sign that law. If you sign that law, it will affect our education. And he bought and he boss that are under them we telling them don't sign that law. If you sign it, our quota of our quota of oil will be affected. And the people in Europe will be speaking again, calling their own brother, their own son. Make sure you don't sign that law. That will, and there will be disunity, and the same problem has continued for more than 100 years. And there has been nobody that can come out and say this is the direction to follow. These guys know what they are doing. Don't you know you don't want to think they don't know what they are doing. The Britain, they know what they're doing. What they use for us is called divide and rule. Any student of political science knows what I'm talking about. It is called divide and rule. They know that diversity has a limitation. Diversity has limitation. Go to any Chinese company, Japanese company, they will never put an African man at the Amazon affair. In fact, Chinese people are noted for doing family businesses. I've studied Chinese people a long time in my research. Family business, the father will have the business. And we give the business to his son. By the time the son is dying, he will give it to his grandson. And they will put all their family members there. If a Chinese man enters a street in New York, he will bring all his Chinese brothers from China and make sure they are the ones that buy, buy all the houses in that street. They will create their own community. You can't break into their midst. We have tried it many times in my city here. You cannot break into their midst. They will not allow you to come in. Then why didn't they say diversity is good? The Chinese people will they will come together and ensure that they form a common bond. They will never bring you in an African man to their midst. Even if you break in their midst, they put you put you at the surface level. They won't allow you to see anything very deep. All their businesses, you won't see it. How they're making money, you won't know it. They will just keep you at the at the periphery. <laughs> because they know that diversity has weaknesses. Diversity has weaknesses. Diversity has weakness. Yes, my brother, the fuel crisis has some deliberate. I, I, I also, I also thought about it. That it could be a deliberate sabotage, but it still boils down to what I'm saying today. It is a sabotage because the interest of some people are better than the interest of others. So some people are advancing their own selfish interests, and it also comes down to the issue of bringing people that has different values together and trying to match them into thinking in the same way and the people that sold this dummy to us they don't do that in our country every attempt that africans make to break into the top echelon of of management in canada and america they will resist it how many nigerians are mds of companies in the u.s 
How many Nigerians are MDs of companies in Canada? Out of 100 MDs, you find only one African or two. And even if you can get that two, ah, you will sweat. They will make you manager, as soon as manager, whatever, but they will never put you in charge of their business. They will never put you in charge of their business. They will never put you in charge. They won't give you the power and authority to dictate to them. They will not do it at the very top. Nigerians are doctors in America. They are doing well. They have their own practice or whatever. But when you are talking about decision makers, by the time you put 1,000 Americans together, Americans together, you will find five, six, seven Africans among them. Are they stupid? They were stupid. So they will not put the power and the authority of their industry into the hand of a foreigner. They won't do it. They won't do it. And they are the ones that sold the dummy of diversity to us. And said, everybody should come together. And and uh, the Ausas did this, this, 520 languages, 743 tribes. And they match them together. People that are thinking differently. People whose value systems differ. I'm setting this foundation to let you know the problem we are facing is very strong, very fundamental, and it has existed for at least 103 years. So until institutions, structures, and systems begin to emerge, people are coming together and they are now developing institutions. Now, Nigeria made an attempt to correct some of these flaws during the restructuring and sorry, I mean, the restructuring and the confab that was done about three years ago. But the people that have vested interest, the people that have vested interest in the disunity of the country, they will never implement all the recommendations of the convert. They will not do it. Because they know that by the time things are integrated, by the time things are integrated, some people that are actually enjoying the disunity, that are benefiting from the disunity, their interest will collapse. But these things happen in many nations, in all nations of the world. America, Britain, they all have people that have vested interest. There is no nation or another that doesn't have corrupt people. Every nation has people that want their own interests to come first. How do they capture, how do they, how do they solve this problem? Institutions, systems, and structure. Why are we suffering in the midst of abundance? Africans are the only group of people I know that have things in abundance and yet they suffer for it. How can a country that has one of the largest deposits of oil and gas? Nigeria was the was the United States largest customer before the US changed recently and started buying their oil from another country. I'm not sure now if they have been restated. I'm not sure. But Nigeria was the largest, largest customer. So the US will come and buy our oil because we, we our crude oil was very good. And we were like number six, number seven. When you look at the OPEC, the OPEC list of oil producing countries in the world, you see Kuwait, you see Bahrain, you will see um, Iraq, you see Iran. Nigeria is like number six out of them. <laughs> it is the same country that is reputed to be number six that is suffering most. That is suffering most. And this thing didn't just start. Nigeria had one of the largest, largest um, um, deposits of palm kernel. Palm kernel, the palm kernel that is used to make oil, to make many things. Nigeria has one of the largest in the 1970s. And the government of Malaysia came, they picked those palm kernel, they picked the seeds, went to Malaysia and began to plant, began to harvest. And because they developed systems, structures, and institutions, Malaysia became the largest exporter of palm kernel products, including oil. And they were exporting back to Nigeria. And the leaders opened their eyes, opened their ears. Nigeria, the Nigeria leaders, they could not do anything. Because of weak institutions, weak systems, and weak structure. And the foundation of this weakness is this wrong concept of diversity. There is a there, are, there, 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 there is diverse group in America. How are the Americans doing it? There is Spanish, there are Jamaicans, there are all kinds of people in America. Different people. How are they able to structure their society so that their own diversity uh, concept is different from our own? How are they able to structure it that their own diversity is done in a way they didn't break apart? US has 50 states plus some other islands. They could have broken it. Okay, 20 states, go. 10 states, go. How did they do it in a way 
that in spite of some communities speaking Spanish, like my sister said, other communities speaking English, they were able to establish common front, common goal. Of course, there are some pockets of challenges they are facing as well. Uh, discrimination, black problem, whatever. Those are minor problems. At the center, they are still very, very strong. They are still very, very strong. So, we have a lot of problems. And I'm just trying to stimulate all this morning, this afternoon, to see a bigger picture. To see a bigger picture. These things go beyond, oh, the government is bad. The president is bad. What is at the bottom <laughs> is bigger. It's like you, you are looking at an iceberg. An iceberg on an ocean. You see the tip of the iceberg. Below the sea is a mass of ice. So if you are looking at the tip, oh, this ice is very small. That was what finished the trade, the, the, the ship, the, 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 the Titanic ship. The Titanic ship was going when they used a telescope to look at the, the, at the ice. They saw a little ice. A little ice. They just say it's a, it's a small ice. And so the sailors were going. By the time the ice got closer, the ship got closer to the ice, the bigger chunk of ice under had damaged major parts of the ship. And water was going in. They did not know. Water was going in. Water was going in. By the time they discovered, it was too late. That is the disadvantage in looking at things in a very parochial, short-sighted manner. Oh, the problem is just leaders, just government. No, the problem is deeper than the people we are looking at in office. The leaders we are seeing now, all the corrupt, bad leaders that Nigeria has now, they are just a reflection of the lopsided, distorted systems and structures in the country. And that is why a lot of people that love that country, they are crying out for restructuring. For restructuring. Because they know you build a house on a faulty foundation. There is no correction you can make. I'm not a civil engineer. So let's, let me assume that the foundation was very bad. So foundation can be, can, can be repaired. I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe an engineer can correct me here. But there are some foundations that you have to demolish the house and rebuild. You have to demolish the house and rebuild. So when you look at a man who is carrying a load on his head and the load is bent, there is a problem in the language. You look at a man carrying a load on his head, he's walking, and the load is bent like this. And you're looking at this, you, you, this man, your load is bent. The man will tell you, you are looking at my head. You are not looking at my leg. What is making my load to be bent is not my head. It is in my leg because the man is crippled. So the problem is foundational. It is not an issue of the leaders. The leaders that we have in Africa and Nigeria today are just reflections of the foundational problem of bad structures, weak institutions. What is the foundation of bad structure and weak institution? It is the faulty, lopsided ide ideology that diversity is always a good concept. Diversity has advantages and disadvantages. It is this concept of diversity that the colonial masters, Britain, used for us, and they tagged it, divide and rule. Divide when you divide them, we can rule them. The more diverse they are, the more problems they will have, and the more problems they have, the more they will depend on us to help them out. So they know what they are doing. So if they have put your bus in a place, outside the place, and they make sure that people with similar values, similar thinking, similar mindset are in a place, the problems will be reduced. There will still be problems, but they will be reduced, and the level of dependence on American Britain will reduce. But they use the concept of divide and rule. Talk to any political science graduates who have studied Nigeria's history, Ghana history, Cote d'Ivoire history. Let us use divide and rule. Divide them very well. Make sure that their languages are so different. Make sure that their values are different. And force them to join together. Force them to put water and oil and petrol and kerosene in the same cup. And try to mix it. And mix it. And mix it and mix it and mix it and cook it and expect it to become a unified content. Impossible. Impossible. Weak systems. Weak systems. All the leadership problem we are facing today is coming out are coming out of the systems and the institutions and the structures that were sold to us. And those systems and structures came out of the faulty diversity strategy that they sold to us so diversity produced institutions institutions produce leaders 
So you want to solve the problem of leadership, you don't solve it at that end, you solve it at the other end. The end of diversity, the root problem. How do we structure this country? In a way, we are not going to split. We are not going to divide. But how do we structure it? How are they doing it in America? People are speaking Spanish, they are speaking English, they have different languages, the Jamaicans are there, Colombians are there, Chinese Americans are there, they have people from Haiti, all of them, and they still stay together. And the country is still functioning. And they don't kill to buy fuel. And there is no large problem. How are they doing it? Devils is not all bad, it has advantages, but how are they doing it? Thank you, sir. Yes, Tower of Babel. There is a biblical example that my brother gave now. The Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel. Hey, even God Almighty, when he saw that they were building a tower, ah, God scattered them because God introduced something into their midst, different languages. Immediately, different languages enter. The equation, everything changes. Everything changed and they scatter. That's a biblical story that we can relate to secular and contemporary issues. Weak systems have produced weak leaders. We can never get good leaders in that country until we change systems and structures. And until and if we want to change systems and structures, we go down to correct and adjust and amend the diversity issue. The, the people that are experts in that area, they should be consulted to do it. Some of the issues that can be used some of the concept is this thing they are shying away from restructuring restructuring the people that have the knowledge all the professors all the political people they have said let us restructure this country we are not breaking it apart they let us restructure it they spent billions of dollars on confab they threw away the reports they spent billions of dollars on a, a put a panel whatever whatever they threw the report away they, they have done all kind of panel and confab they don't want to do it because immediately they solve the problem of diversity, it will impact structures, systems, and institutions. When structures, systems, and institutions are impacted and strengthened, it will lead to the emergence of effective leaders. When effective leaders come, corruption will drop. They will block all the loopholes. Right people will be, will be able to vote. People that qualify to rule people to be leaders, they will imagine. But the current structures and systems issues are not favorable to the emergence of right leaders. That is the problem. They have been designed in a way that the person that has the largest amount of money will be the one that can buy, buy the position. Godfatherism. A lot of things are wrong. And so we can continue to pray and fast. We can continue to too bad to vote. Continue to vote. Continue to vote. We will keep voting for the wrong set of people. And the result will be massive queues. Today it is fair problem. Tomorrow it will be food problem. Next tomorrow it will be water problem. The next time it will be drainage problem. It will, there, are, there are so many social problems that emerge from weak leadership. And the, the trajectory, the trajectory problems start from the diversity and structural problems that the country has. Leading to the issue of institutions and structural and systems. The country has systems. Nigeria, for example, has systems and institutions. EFCC, ICPC, this one. They have all those guys. They are doing a lot of work, many of them, but majority of their work is being compromised. And at the end of the day, few results are being seen. They do everything, arrest this person, arrest that person, do media trial. At the end of the day, the person will go and get a good, a good lawyer, get 10 lawyers, and then go to the court, and the judge will be bribed, and they strike out the case. And the same process start all over again. How many people have been sent to jail? How many leader? How many leader that has been convicted or has been accused has been convicted? Out, out of the convicted, how many have been sent to jail? In spite of the billions that each of these so-called institutions, systems and structures that the country has, in spite of the billions that are consuming. So in 2018, the country is going out again to organize a vote and election. People are trooping out. They are spending money, printing ballot boxes, doing all kind of workshops. Politicians are coming, 
doing campaign, billions and billions and billions will be spent all to one thing to elect wrong set of leaders again. Because the systems and the structures and the institutions are defective. They are defective because at their root is a faulty diversity and structural problem. It's a big problem that until we solve it, there is no solution. Now, I look at this issue critically and I look at ah, so why are we going around the cycle? Is it the fault of one man? Is it Buhari? Is it this person? I said this thing is beyond one individual. The problem is not a, a, an individual problem. It's a systemic problem. It's a systemic problem. So if we have people that are coming out, there are people that are speaking. There are a lot of people that have spoken about this issue. A lot of people. But sometimes when the quantity of people speaking is few, the government does nothing about it. When everybody in the nation rises up, and they're talking, and they're talking, using their power, writing, going to court, a time will come, revolution will break out. And the government in power will have no excuse. They will have no excuse than to do the biddings of the people. There was a story that happened some years back. I can't remember, I can't remember the country. When the citizens of the country, they stormed the House of Assembly. No, they stormed the presidency of that country. And they forcefully ejected the president. It's an Asian, it's an Asian country. I mean, is it Singapore? I can't remember. Uh, millions of people, like, like two million people, they marched to the presidency. The president ran away. How many people will, will, will be killed? So just cut their gun. How many will you kill? After they are shot, like 20, 30 people, they drop their gun. This is a revolution. The president was changed in 24 hours. <laughs> 24 hours. So, we have a big problem in our hand. Now, let me tell you something. Systems, structures, and institutions are the drivers for the emergence of effective leaders. Huh. Let me tell you the types of institutions we have in Africa using Nigeria as case study. I have five here. There, are, there may be more. We have political institutions. We have educational institutions. We have religious institutions. We have family institutions. And we have legal systems, the courts, and all those stuff. All of these institutions I've mentioned now, they come together to produce people who will lead those institutions. So, politics now produce political leaders, councillor, local government, governor, president, all across. Educational institutions produce doctors, professors who lecture students and shape them. Religious institutions produce pastors and leaders in churches and mosques and whatever who speak to people and model them. Family institutions produce husband and wife who model children and shape them. Legal systems produce judges, lawyers. In each of these institutions, if there is a defect, if there is a problem, if the process is faulty, Every effort that is implemented, every money that is spent to produce the best leaders will only produce quack leaders. And when the final product comes out, in, post, in, in engineering, we call it reject or rework. When a bad product comes out of the production line and you sell it to the, to, to the customers, they either reject it, call your company, and ask you to, to refund their money, or they ask you to rework it. So reject or rework. In both instances, there is a cost. Now in politics, you can reject. Once the man has been made the governor of a country, you cannot reject. You cannot reject. He must serve his four years. You cannot rework. What will the ordinary man on the street do to change the governor? You just make noise, make noise, complain, complain, make noise. Nothing is done. So this may be easier to do for a product, but for human being and in politics, it's difficult. No one I, I, I found it is extremely difficult, if not impossible, to reject or to rework a political leader in Africa. I think it's impossible. You cannot rework them. You can't reject them. They are forced on the people. Because the process, the institution, is very defective. The same as religious institution. Once a pastor becomes a pastor, 
and as a church, the members cannot do anything. You can't reject him. You rather leave his church. You can't change him and rework him. He put costs on you. <laughs> Legal systems, courts, judges, lawyers. Once they graduate and they pass the law exam and they begin to practice, you can't reject them. You either go to them and bring your case to them or go to another judge, another lawyer. And if your case enters a court, you can't tell the judge, I don't want you. So the problem is that immediately leaders emanate, immediately leaders emerge from our institutions. There is no solution again. You cannot change them again. You cannot. It will take some spiritual and probably some physical or proactive effort to force change. Change is very difficult. I am a change management consultant. Change is very difficult. In my experience, the most difficult set of resources to change are human resources. You can change a software, change it to a new version. You can upgrade a software. You cannot upgrade human being. You cannot upgrade human being. Even God Almighty has problem with human beings. God Almighty. His word has been written in the scripture. Everybody will see the scripture. Thou shalt not commit adultery. They will go and do it. Even God Almighty has problem in upgrading people because God doesn't force people. He wants them to do things from their own free will. So if God has that problem, who are you and I? It is very difficult to change leaders. Change management concept tells us change always has resistance. And the, not the systems, not the computer, not the material. The people, this, 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 the resources that will resist you most are human beings. So immediately leaders come out of these defective institutions and they enter the society, it is too late. And then the result of it is what we are seeing today now in Nigeria. People are living in grinding poverty. You see kegs and queues in fuel stations, in gas stations. People that are living in a country that is reputed to be the sixth largest oil producer. They are inside the sun now, queuing up for fuel. Many of them cannot cook their food for Christmas. Many cannot go out in their cars with their children because the leaders have already emerged. Once the leader emerged, there is no reject. There is no rework. You cannot say you don't want the leader. It's your governor. If he passes a law, you don't obey the arrest and jail you. You cannot change him and rework him. The concept of reject and rework does not apply to, to, to leadership when they are out. It only applies to products. Because it is easier to change product than change people. So what will a wise government do? What will a wise government that is actually serious with change do? They will go to the root of the problem. They will not go to the stem. All the things that they are doing in Nigeria to change that country will not work until they go to the root. You don't solve the problem of a tree from the stem or the leaves. If the tree has a problem, it must have come from the root. Because the root is what gives nutrients, gives water, gives carbon dioxide, gives everything to the tree. This is pure logic. Any primary school students will know that this is just logic. Logic. A car is malfunctioning. Where is the first thing you touch in the car? Engine. You open the bonnet, check the engine. Your car is driving the road and it's jacking. The next thing to do is to go and check tire or check windscreen or check the, the door. You go to the engine. The root of the car is the engine. What is the root of all the problems that we are seeing in Nigeria today and in Africa at large? The root. Diversity. The similar set of people. People that are not similar. That have varieties of value systems that are difficult to reject and rework. You, you compress them into the same box and you lock the box and put the key in the pocket of the Korean masters. <laughs> And nothing is done. And so you're trying to change these people. Change them. Bring new presidents. Bring new minister. New policy. New product. Vision 2020. Vision 2050. And the result is that the people are still king for fuel. After billions and billions and billions have been wasted on refinery this, on a foreign this, on privatization this, you will do those things. There will be a pocket of results. But they will not be sustainable. At the end of the day, you will come back to the same point because you are solving the problem from the stem and not from the roots. You are solving the problem from the stem and not from the roots. What are the consequences of poor and weak institutions? Number one, emergence of bad leaders. 
in my own estimation, most African countries, Nigeria being the leader, has more than 90% bad leaders. If that is not even a very generous estimate, few people, the ones that are very good, are few. If you take 36 state governors in Nigeria, you cannot count five <laughs> that are reasonable. Is that like one, one is planting the statue of Zuma and spending millions and millions, or is giving them 18 months, 18 days leave, or the other person is on salary and doing party, all kind of irresponsible people. But it's not their fault. The systems and the institutions that 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 created their emergency, they are all defective. They are defective because the diversity diversity dummy that the country is built upon that that is that, that the leaders are refusing to correct and adjust is the one that is speaking into those institutions so you want to get the best leader to manage health in nigeria this man is a yoruba man yoruba man and he has tested character he has proven integrity he has experience. He has not just gone to school to acquire medical certificate, medical um, 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 skills. He has been in charge of different institutions at different levels with the world, with WHO, uh, with a British company. And he has a very, 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 very reputable resume and impressive background. And this man applies for the job. The man that is the head of the panel is an awesome man. I said, no, 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 no. We can't put a Yoruba man in charge. This is our own time. And he goes to a particular part of his own region, picks a man that is far, 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 junior and local and, and, and weaker than the man that's a Yoruba man and say he must be there. What will happen? Now that man gets there, he will not be, be a stooge to the panel leader who put him there. So if that man calls him, you have been given 20 billion as allocation. 5 billion is my own. You know I put you there. That is what is happening in that country. I am not saying that you are the best, also are the best. I'm just using it as an example. It could be an Igbo man that is the best. It could be an Igbo man that is the best. And the, and the other people are not good. So the concept of diversity, you apply for any job, for any role. In America, in Britain, the number one thing that they want to see is, are you an American? Do you meet all the standards, your age, education, you qualify to apply? Now they have their own politics as well, party politics and whatever. That is common all over the world. But before they start to say, it's from Montana. It's from uh, Illinois. Now, Illinois people are not good. It's from uh, San Francisco. They don't think like that. The only thing that dominates their mindset is party. Oh, it's a Democrat. Oh, it's a Republic. Which is normal everywhere in the world. Which is normal everywhere in the world. And so we begin to put square pegs in land holes. Nigeria has thousands of doctors in the US. Many of them have honed their own practice for several years with experiences ranging 10, 20, 30 years. Many of them will never be consulted to manage the health system of that country because of the defective institutions, weak systems, and the weaknesses are provoked by the wrong diversity and structural problems that the country has. That is why when people like Wale Shoyinka and other people are canvassing in Nigeria, oh, let's do a restructuring. You think that these people are just mad. What are they saying? If you are not educated to see that this problem is not from the leaves, it's from the roots, you will just be hammering them all the time. These guys are not, no, they're not, let's just bring anybody that is good. No, it's not about the leadership. Bring the best professor from Harvard. There will be a problem. Didn't Okonjo where I come from World Bank? OB Ezekiel City, all these people came from World Bank. The country is, they are still queuing for gas. Because the country is made up of diverse groups of people with different vested interests. Wicked people, selfish people, from different tribes speaking more than 700, more than 500 languages and 700 plus tribes. And you put everybody in the same box and you want them to sit down together, think the same way, talk the same way, act the same way because we feel diversity is strong. 
But the people that sold it was the Britons. They don't use that in their own country. Everybody in England speaks English. Everybody in England speaks English. <laughs> so there will be margins of bad leaders. There will be margins of social crisis, like fuel scarcity, unemployment, industrial action and strikes. Those things will continue. They will continue. They will continue until we solve this problem of structures, systems, and institutions. There will be political instability. When there is instability in a country, it has a direct correlation on foreign direct investment. The people that have money will not come to your country to invest. They will not. Because political stability speaks to the enactment of laws, regulation, policies. So what happens is that if you are not stable politically, that means laws will be changing. Taxes will be changing. So when a company is coming to invest, they are not able to plan for the next 30 years. They can only plan in small trenches. And every four, four years, their plan will be changing. They pay 10% tax in the next four years. Another government comes in, tumbles everything upside down. Your tax is, is 30%. And then they pay it. And then they... So there will be instability. So that is why FDI... I mean, political stability is one of the metrics, one of the drivers for measuring FDI. Why is everybody taking their business to, to South Africa? Taking it to taking it to um, 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 China? Taking it to... Because their politics is very stable. They change government, but they are stable. When FDI drops and foreign direct investment into a country drops, you know what I, that, that we do? When those, com when those companies bring their business to your country, they pay tax to your government. They provide employment. They bring in technology. They bring in knowledge. They bring in expertise. So, technology transfer will suffer. Knowledge transfer will suffer. Unemployment will, su I mean, employment will suffer. Taxes will drop. So, some of those companies actually have left Nigeria. Some of them have actually left. There will be what is called capital flight. All those companies that are existing already, and they cannot continue again in this political instability, they will draw their capital. Sorry, their, 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 their machineries. Pull it down. They will withdraw their money from the banks. Take them abroad. The average man will be the one to suffer most. The leaders at the top, they have made provision for themselves and their children. So many of them don't feel these things. The people that are carrying cakes and queuing for seven hours in first station are the one paying for it now. And unfortunately, they are the same set of people that will be bribed tomorrow to vote for these people. Look at where this irony and dilemma is. Consequences of poor and weak institution. Poverty and crime rate will increase. I can't overstretch that. Poverty and crime rates will increase. That's a subject for a whole day. Number four. There will be... I think I've covered it. What are the solutions? The number one solution, like I've said, we need to revisit the foundation of that nation. You see, I, I mean, I have a friend. I tell people, not everybody will live abroad. Now, I'm not saying it to spite people. I'm not saying it to be unrealistic. Not everybody will live abroad. There are people that are doing well in Africa. There are people in Nigeria that are making a lot of money and doing fine. Although very few of them, because most of them are actually stealing money. Bring 100 Nigerian billionaires together. 98 of them are corrupt. Quote me anywhere. Bring 100 billionaires together and tell me how they made their money. So when I hear a story, and there's one man that gave uh, 1 billion or 2 billion dollars to a church as offering, there's nothing bad in it. But I told my wife one day, I said, I need to interview the man for 10 minutes. And I will tell you that that man is corrupt. In the present day Nigeria, you cannot be a billionaire without being corrupt. Only very few instances. Corruption is not carrying guns to the bank and robbing the bank. Corruption is not that alone. That's part of it. Corruption is not giving bribe to people. There are so many things that people do. Tax evasion. A lot of things. You will deliberately not pay tax. 
because you know the man in power is corruption. All that people will pay tax, but you will not pay tax. So most of those billionaires, they do all kind of racketing, forex racketing, they do all kind of rubbish, all kind of things, and they make billions. You can't try some of those things in advance, they will jail them. They will jail them. Because the government in Britain will make sure you pay 40% as tax. The richer you are, the more money you pay. You cannot run away. In fact, they are now spying people that are rich now. If you take your money and you hide the money in some offshore location, they will track it down there and they will prosecute you. When I came to this country, they were asking me, do you have money in anywhere in the world? I have lived in England. Do you have money in England? They were asking me. I said, ah, what's, your, what's your business? How does it concern you? They know we must know. Because if you have money in England, you must pay tax. I said, I have never had it in my life. I didn't make the money in this country. They said, no, you are enjoying this country. If you have money in England, we must collect the tax. You can't believe it. That is me, oh, that I'm not a billionaire. <laughs> so how much more a billionaire? So put 100 billionaires in Nigeria together, or a Ghanaian, or an Uganda, who is a billionaire, gather them to a room. I will tell you 98 of them are corrupt, if not all. They will have been involved in one corruption or the other. To let you know that the emergence of a strong nation, the emergence of a great nation, is not just measured by the number of rich people in that nation, majority of whom might have become rich because they stole money, or because they manipulated the weak system and avoided tax of black people, or used their privileged position to obtain contracts that other people actually deserved. All these things are traces and symbols of corruption. And they are as a result of weak institutions, defective systems, and bad structures. So there are so many other points I put down that are solutions to this problem. But they are just secondary solutions. The primary solution is this. The present day Africa is made up of countries which numerous diverse groups of people with different mindsets different value system and those countries may not work until these structural problems are corrected a weak system will produce a weak leader weak institutions will produce weak leaders so if your governors are bad they are not the ones that are bad the institutions that produce them are bad. If your councillors are corrupt, no, they are not corrupt. The institutions that produce them are corrupt. Now, I will said all of these things. What do we do? Some of us, including myself, we don't have the power to change the mind of the government. You cannot tell Nigeria president now to forcefully implement implement and um, confirm report. Confirm report. He will not do it. Who are you to talk to him? All the big, big people have spoken to him. He said, no, he will not do it. Why do you think he will not do it? How did he get there himself? How do you think he got there? Who sponsored him there? So the same set of people who gave him money who sponsored this election, you expect him to sign a restructuring policy that will not damage their interests. He will not do it. Regardless of how credible the president of Nigeria is, he did not bring himself into power. Some people bankrolled that election for him. So, the constitution, sorry, the restructuring that people have been conversing for, if they implement it, it will damage the interest of the people that put him there. That is why he will never agree to it. What do you think an average man can do? It is a very difficult thing to do. But I wish that there can be a system. There can be some groups of people that can come together and pull force together. Majority of these people that emerge as leaders, they use the power of money. And some of these funds are actually stolen. Anybody that will be able to make these changes in these countries must not have benefited from the proceeds of corruption. 
including being elected and being sponsored by corrupt people. So, if the elections will cost you 20 billion or 30 billion, how do you get it? Since you don't want them to sponsor you. If they have not sponsored you and you manage to become governor or counselor or president and you are a good leader, the problem of that nation is, is going to be solved. Because when you get there, you have no allegiance to anybody but with the truth at yourself. But the unfortunate thing is that there is no single person that has become anything in that country that wasn't bankrolled and supported. This is why we now need the emergence of the private sector. Godly, God-fearing people that have private businesses that are very rich coming together intentionally to bankroll people to power. Not using government money now. Not using corrupt money now. So if I'm a billionaire, brother Adebayo is a billionaire, sister Bridget is a billionaire, we are all God-fearing. Brother Sunday Adebayo is a billionaire. And we all come together. And we discover that there are 10 different people that have proven themselves to be very good, men of integrity, and we decide to sponsor them to become governor. And we do all the calculation, all the money you need for campaign, the money you need for adverts, everything is 20 billion. How much is our competitor sp spending? Who is a political person? Oh, he's spending 20 billion too. Okay, we give you 30 billion. And they will support you. The people that we do that thing must not have benefited from corrupt money. If they have benefited from, from corrupt money and you become a governor, they will come after you and tell you to give me part of the money. So the problem is still like a cycle. So if in that country there is nobody that has made billions, that is rich, that is doing well, that hasn't benefited from corrupt money, it is difficult for him to sponsor somebody to power. Can you see the web, the web of problems? that Nigeria is in now as a case study. Can you see the web? It's a vicious cycle. 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 Who are the people that will sponsor the right leaders? Who will make these changes? Who are they? How many billionaires are in Nigeria who have made their billions legally? And if they search them, they check them, check the records, search their account worldwide, they will not find any stolen money. If we can get people like that, three, four, five, six, seven of them who have money and they don't accurate claim contracts and they cannot trace any illicit fund in their account anywhere in the world. And these people can come together voluntarily and decide to sponsor and bankroll individuals that they trust, that are good leaders. And they can put their money in the other person. That is a major avenue for us to break this vicious cycle. If we can't find such individuals, my friends, brothers and sisters, I don't see any solution to this problem other than private private initiatives for success for individuals so individuals will be taking their destiny in their hand and then you solve your own problem you either travel out of the country or you create in your own heaven for yourself your family and for other people that you can help so private initiatives that's why i say that individually we are very strong collectively we are weak because collectively we open the door to revelations of corruption that oh you were a corrupt person. That one, you, I gave money last year. You stole money. So collectively, is a problem. Collectively, is a problem. I decided to throw this part today and speak on this subject because of the grippling problems facing our people in Nigeria today. Being the Christmas Eve. And I sympathize with everybody going through problems, going through poverty, going through lack as a result of this fuel crisis. I wish I had money or I had the power to solve that problem. I wish I had that kind of money and I had the power to help and to solve. But I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. 2018 is seven more days from now. 
are we still going to do things the same way? Are we still going to vote for the same set of people? Are we still going to continue deceiving ourselves and brandishing all across the street? Oh, we are strong people. Diversity is a strength uh, uh, as large as we are. And we are, and we are deceiving ourselves. The diversity that is killing us. <laughs> the people that sold it to us, they don't embrace it in their own country. They embrace one language, one value, one thinking. They sold it to us, amalgamated us together, and it has not helped us at all. And until something is done to solve this problem, nothing will happen. The best that will happen is individual initiative for success. Every parent will take off his daughter and his children, help them, send them to school, send them abroad. They succeed, come back to take them away. Each person will not be dealing with his own children and family. But collectively, it cannot work until we solve the problem from the roots. The structural problem must be solved from the roots. The system is defective. It's lopsided. It's confused. Until it is solved from the roots, there's no problem. There's no solution to it. I want to wish you a very, very Merry Christmas. All my friends, I wish I can mention your name, all, everybody, Brother Adebayo, Sister Fumi, Brother Yoim, Brother Yomi, uh, Brother Follow Risho, everybody that has been watching and has watched today, have uh, left us with a burden for our nation in Africa. This is Value Systems Change Agenda. And uh, I wanted to change the topic, but I felt an urge in my heart, in my mind, to tell this uh, part today. Nigeria is under a serious siege. Yes, yes, yes. It's a satanic system. I didn't know the extent of rocks when everybody was clamoring for restructuring until I began to look into it. Say, ah! Shh. The system is satanic. The structure is evil. They deliberately designed it that way under the nose of the colonial masters and they call this divide and rule. It was after they left that the concept of divide and rule was blown open. Bring them together. Multiple interest groups. The more they are diverse, the weaker they will be. Normally, diversity brings strength. But normally, you put 740 tribes together in the same house. You kill them. <laughs> it happened in the scripture. It did not work. If something failed in the Bible, where will it not fail? If something failed in the Bible, where will it not fail? God just introduced diversity and it failed. Everyone scattered. Their languages change and they scattered. And you think it will work in real life. If something can fail in the Bible, it can fail anywhere. It can fail anywhere. But because the people at the top are enjoying the failure. It is putting more money in their bank account. They are sharing the oil blocks among themselves. They are having access to all diamonds. So, like Brother Yomi said now, Brother Olubido said now, it will take some level of madness and force. You know when God wanted to take the Israelite out of Egypt? God didn't give ice cream to Pharaoh. Go and serve him ice cream and salad. God used force. Force. Let my people go or else. And they have, I mean, Pharaoh said, or else what? Hey, God said, or else what? Okay. When God, after God killed all their force bomb, he released them. You don't want to know the millions of young people whose destiny are at stake. Some of we, some, some of us are, are older now. Many of us are in our forties and fifties. We have gone to school. We have children. We may not be rich, but we are not. We are not poor. We are not begging. What do you think is the fate of all those young, young children, four year old, three years old, who are just being born into this satanic system that has no plan for their future? Go to the airport today, in Nigeria. It is packed with crowd of people. Anytime I am in Lagos, Mutala Airport, you will be pushing your way through the crowd. Everybody is finding a way to travel out. Those that are not living abroad permanently, they are always going. Vacation, going out, going out, going out. Being in that country and having no, no plan or no opportunity to go anywhere is, is, <laughs> is the worst level of demotiv demotivation. Demotivation. But why should that be? Why do you think all of us like do you think we like living abroad? Majority of my of my uh uh, uh 
I'm, I'm disciples. If I can put it that way, they are, they are in Africa. If we start the 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 level of difficulty starting a church, if I, my ministry is towards Africans, not white people. So God, the Lord spoke to me. I'm sending you to your people. I'm sending you to your people. The Lord told me I am sending you to your people. And my people are not Americans and Canadians and Germans and English. So I am sent to Africans and Nigerians. So starting a church and run a ministry in the Western world is far more difficult than doing it in Africa. Because when you're among your people, there are certain things that you don't struggle with. Now they have a lot of laws and systems in this country that make it difficult for churches to do so many things. You want to rent a space for church, you can't get it. You want to get a property, you can't get it. And they will go and confine you into the manufacturing manufacturing uh, um, 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 suburb where it will be difficult for people to come to church. <laughs> but it's not the case back home in Africa. You can put your church on the main road with big billboards and go out for evangelism. You can't go for evangelism here to some places. They will tell you if you try, they will call the police on you. So there are a lot of disadvantages that touches experience abroad here. So what am I saying this for? We love to live in Africa. I love to live in Nigeria. I go there regularly. I love to, in spite of the problem, I love to do it. So we all long and love that a day is going to come that our country will be emancipated. There will be a little bit of respite. We have been longing for that. Longing for it. Longing for it. Every year seems worse than the previous. <laughs> we have been longing for it. Longing for it. Somebody said something to me some time ago. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not a political person. I don't belong to APC. I don't belong to PDP. Although there are certain things I like about Buhari Nigeria. There are certain things I don't like about him. I don't hate him. I love him as a person. You don't hate anybody. I like certain things about him. I don't like certain things about him. But that person said to me, he said, if Buhari runs through all this time, maybe he does second time, I don't know, he doesn't do it, and Nigeria is, remains the same. It is hopeless for that country. When he said it, I thought about it. Maybe you are right to it to an extent. If the other people get back power, if they manage to get it back, all the grounds they have lost in terms of corruption, they will cover it tenfold. They will cover it tenfold. The looting will start. The sharing will start. <laughs> and Nigeria will be returned to square one. Now the progress is not much, just a little progress, but it will now be returned to square one. Because any other corrupt leader that becomes president, that country is finished. All the other people will not come back. They have lost contracts. They have lost oil blocks. They have lost properties. They will get everything back and begin to acquire more. What will be the hope of the young person? Poverty, unemployment, quack education systems, ritual killings, security risks, armed robbery. That is what our young people are facing in that society today and i'm just here to provoke us not to take up bloody revolution and attack and fight people but to use our intelligence to use our skills and our expertise to lie break our people to speak to authorities they will hear it they will not hear it speak to them talk to young people speak to people talk to them say the truth if you are a leader and you are being inspired to go to politics, Nigeria is a tough terrain. It's a terrain people can be killed because of election. Many people have lost their lives. But there will always be a way when there is a will. I am praying that God will begin to raise kingdom wealth owners. People who are industrialists, who have made money without recourse to corruption, to illicit funds, to drug business. People who can be searched can be checked and they search all their accounts in america they cannot find any list for and they are billionaires who will come together and form alliances and people that are godly that want to be leaders can be bankrolled and sponsored and by the help of god and protection of god 
we can have people that are God-fearing leaders aspiring to become the president of our nations and governors. Imagine if Brother Bayo becomes a governor in the state in Nigeria. Imagine if Brother Ayutune Oke becomes a governor in the state in Nigeria. Imagine, imagine if, for example, I become a governor in the state. Imagine if all of us here becomes a leader. What will happen to that country? Will somebody come to you and ask you to sign a check before because they want to steal money? Will you sign it? Will somebody be good, being an Aousa man, but he's the best for the job, and somebody will tell you, I'm a Yoruba man, I'm the brother, I must get the job. Will you give it to him? If you do it well in your own state, I do it well in my state, we all do it well in our own states, I will begin to pour money into the industry, pour money into scholarships, I begin to conserve money, I begin to do roads, begin to, within four years, within four years, if all of us seek re-election, I will get re-elected. We spend eight years. We transform that nation. We transform that nation. And we have not stolen money. And we are getting money from independent sponsors. Maybe World Bank is giving them money. And all the other corrupt people are trying everything possible. And we are willing them all the time. A time will come, they will join us. The light of Christ will shine to them. They will join us. They will join us. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas once again. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. I have a lot to say, but I reserve the rest of tomorrow. Tomorrow is the 25th, it's a Christmas day, so I'm going to make it a Christmas gift tomorrow. It may not be as long as this, but it's going to be in the evening as well 1 p.m. New York and not and uh, can and Toronto time, 6 p.m. UK and Europe time, 7 p.m. West African time. As we look into the 25th edition of value system change agenda i'm trusting god that a book can come out of this i'm looking for transcribers uh, anybody that will pick all these 31 videos listen to them and transcribe them flesh them out and then we will look for a very good publisher and we publish a very sound book and uh, it's going to bless and change so many people and uh, i'm looking for someone that, 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 that we can pay that can do it if you know of anybody that can transcribe that's very good it's going to be a work, a project, and it's going to be paid very well. Paid very well for it. Other persons in Nigeria, I mean, this is something people can do in Nigeria. Many people don't have work. I mean, I know that if I advertise it now, I will get a lot of people. <laughs> if I go online now, I will get hundreds. I advertised a job somewhere last year. I got 500 CVs. 500 CVs within two weeks. I couldn't believe myself. Say, ah, So this is as bad as this. 500. So if I go online now and advertise that I need a transcriber, I'll get 1,000 people who want to transcribe because we pay them well to do it. Uh, it's a very simple job. Sit down, play all the video, and be transcribing them. Be typing them out. What I'm saying, typing them out. Typing them out. And arrange them. We will give you structure, chapters, and write them out. And then we will solve the rest. We will correct all the correction and editing later on with the publisher. And the topics we have discussed can transform any nation. We've talked about ritual killing. We we'll talk about bribery and corruption, going late to work, uh, fixing prices, raising people instead of raising properties. We've we'll talked about so many issues. So imagine these things are in different chapters of a book published by a very renowned publisher in the US and we market it and we sell it and young people are reading it. Reading it. Imagine the impact it's going to make on their lives and the changes. So I'm looking forward to that in 2018. If I can get anybody who has patience or you know anybody who is very good, good English speaker, pays attention to details and the person can can receive correction he learns and receive correction it may be a three-month project maybe a two-month project maybe a six-month project and uh we're going to pay the person and it's going to be a good one i just have that vision that this should go into a book uh if there's anybody who knows anyone can do the project can send me a message via my link it's going to be a walk and uh and i believe that it's going to it's going to provide a lot of exposure to to, 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 to that person as well Thank you so much. Merry Christmas in advance. God bless you so much for the time you spent today. It's a Sunday. I want to release us to go and prepare for Christmas tomorrow for our chicken and our Coke and our Fanta and everything. Thank you. God bless you. I love you all.